Are you ready to know what you don't know about money? Then you're in the right place. This is Savvy Insights, a podcast on exploring prosperity, seizing opportunities, and preserving freedom, bringing you tips, tricks, tools, and extreme value. Broadcasting from our studio in Toronto, I'm your host, Baz. I want to personally welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm really glad you're here because this podcast is designed for you. Before we dive in, remember you can reach me on Twitter at insights underscore savvy to discuss further about today's insights. Now let's begin. Is it me or does it feel like today traditional finance is the straggler of our time? As a reminder, if a website doesn't load like in two seconds, then we usually click away. Breaking news, what our friends like to do and investment prices can all be seen in real time on our smartphones. Every day new development and apps are being created by companies to connect clients with their searches. But banks are being completely divorced from this reality. In 2022, why does it take 4-5 to days for international wire transfers to go through? I don't get it. It's like they're loading boats with gold and sending it through the Atlantic. There's absolutely no reason why banks should be able to have centralized databases that are still expensive, costly, and extremely slow. It's crazy to say, but a lot of these banks have really bad security measures because they're deeply lacking. Hackers delight at seeing them. Let's not forget what happened with the CRA and IRS when they got hacked and all the social security numbers were revealed. In the 1950s, IBM computer scientists developed Fortran, the programming language, the language that forms the foundation of core banking software that many banks still use today. Core banking software is a central financial database that keeps track of all accounts and transactions. Anytime you deposit or withdraw funds, the core banking software updates its records. And whenever you log onto your bank's website to check your balance, the server relies on the core banking software for that information. Core banking software is the most critical component of any bank's technological infrastructure. And then there's SWIFT, the international organization that handles the vast majority of international wire transfers, which uses Windows Vista, by the way. Microsoft doesn't even support Vista anymore, but this is what the backbone of the world's premier international payment system uses. I don't care how nice your bank's website looks. Behind banks' cutting-edge displays are a bunch of bailing wires and duct tape just recklessly holding together this acronistic system. A revolution in global banking and finance powered by current technology is long overdue. Enter stage right, cryptocurrencies. The technology for a major disruption is finally here, and it's spreading like wildfire. Here we are, two full decades into the 21st century. In terms of global banking, however, little has changed since the 13th century. That was a time when Moors ruled Americas, Kangas Khan ruled the Mongol Empire, Marco Polo explored new trading routes for Europe, and Fibonacci postulated his famous sequence. The marvel introduced by so many centuries ago was a system called credit. A double entry ledger system meant that many buyers and sellers no longer had to haul carts full of gold from one location to another. Instead, they can quickly and easily make an entry on their books, one in the asset column, one in the liability or equity column. Over the years, no financial development has rivaled this breakthrough. Sure, now banks are automated. Quicker and easier entries on electronic bank balance sheets and ledgers replace outdated physical books. But banking still a centralized, clunky, medieval-like enterprise in its efficiency and it lacks accountability. It's an irrelevant acronym that has no business governing modern-day day-to-day affairs. A legion of middlemen stands between you and your savings on deposits. Not that your bank holds a pile of cash under your straw name. Your bank balance is nothing more than an accounting entry in a bank's electronic database. So banks can be, and generally are, as reckless as they please. Bankers can finance subprime home and car loans, some new investment fad, i.e. SPACs, or any other foolish endeavor they so choose. The recklessness of such deals does not matter to them. They're not investing with their money, they're gambling with your money. And when their gamble goes south, they go to the government with a hat in hand demanding a bailout because they're too important to be held accountable for their idiotic decisions. This high priesthood of modern finance largely goes unchallenged. Build a Greco-Roman style edifice, slap the word bank on the side of the building, and congratulations, you got a sacrosanct institution with unlimited power. It's time to take back the power from the banks. It's time to become your own banker. So here comes cryptocurrency disrupting the traditional financier's priesthood. The next 30 seconds may sound familiar. Imagine there's a room that anyone can access. Inside the room are piggy banks made out of, well, indestructible clear plastic, so everyone can see what's inside every piggy bank at all times. The piggy banks can't be removed from the room, and everyone has a key to their piggy bank. 
The room is equipped with security cameras that anyone in the world can view at any time. And every second of footage is also available at any time for anyone everywhere forever. When I want to pay someone, I go into the room wearing my mask. Everyone can see I'm doing it, but they don't know who I am. I unlock my piggy bank, take out some money, then I put it into another person's piggy bank. Again, everyone can see me do it because it's caught on video forever. That history of footage represents all the Bitcoin transactions of every market participant, starting from the creation of the first Bitcoin data block. That first data block contained 50 Bitcoin upon being solved. I think that was on January 8th, 2009. In traditional finance systems, aka TriFi, that room is locked away deep in the belly of a big bank, and the only people that can access it and the security footage are the people running the bank. Those chosen ones have total control over the room and can use that power to promote their agendas. Crypto finance turns the TriFi system and the global banking system on its head, not to mention every other industry that centralizes information. Bitcoin decentralized the financial system. Bitcoin's protocol is essentially a giant ledger keeping track of who owns how many units of Satoshi. There are a hundred million Satoshis in just one Bitcoin. That's eight decimal places after the one. The Bitcoin ledger records which address has owned every particular Satoshi unit. The bank no longer gets to hold everything hostage on their balance sheets and ledgers that they centrally control. With Bitcoin, no single person owns or controls a central ledger or database. That's a big deal. Right now, banks control 100% of your balances on deposits. But with Bitcoin, they have zero control unless you give them your Bitcoin voluntarily. And they give you back an IOU. That IOU is based on trust. And we know what happens when we give them that trust to the banks. They get greedy and gamble with your deposits. Each Bitcoin transaction goes into a publicly viewable database. And every single human has access to that database and can carry it on their computer or their mobile device. This is the part that confuses people because the coins are not a digital file, but rather entries on an internationally distributed, decentralized proof of work ledger. This means that if you own Bitcoin, what you have is an entry settled on an immutable Bitcoin blockchain record. Suppose every dollar, aka banknote, created a unique serial ID number, and every human has a unique ID number like a social security numbered person. You can think of the blockchain as a giant accounting system that matches every unique banknote serial number with the social security number of its person. The system would show you the entire history of every unique banknote and how it has changed hands since being created, as well as the account of every single social security numbered person. There are other advantages. For example, banks and governments cannot conjure more Bitcoin out of thin air. And unlike banknotes, i.e. dollars, euros, and yen, or other fiat currencies for that matter, investment banks don't have a built-in advantage under this new financial system. No longer are they the first in line to receive freshly printed or digitally created banknotes. An IMF report summed up the very real challenge that cryptocurrencies pose to the current establishment. <clears throat> Virtual currencies in principle question the very paradigm of state-supported fiat currencies and the dominant role that central banks and conventional financial institutions have played in the operation of the financial system. To me, that is music to my ears. On a side note, I don't like using the term digital currency when describing cryptocurrencies that is because in essence all major fiat or paper currencies are more or less digital than physical these days for example fewer than three percent of all dollars in circulation today exist in physical cash that's three percent more than 97 percent of them are created and used only digitally euros dollars yens all are a little more than just digital records on a cloud ledger of some central bank around the world that makes most currencies nearly as digital as cryptocurrencies now I'll get into a few of the cryptocurrencies, starting with the most famous one. The most famous cryptocurrency is, well, of course, Bitcoin. It emerged about 13 years ago. It also garnered a lot of press in 2017 and 2021 for its dramatic price increases. Its history is pretty intriguing. In 2009, the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto released the Bitcoin software code to the world for free. To date, no one has discovered Satoshi's identity, although there are many rumors that people will point to. Since 2021, Bitcoin market capitalization, aka market cap, has grown to a trillion dollars, more than double the value of Ethereum, the cryptocurrency in second place by market cap. Here's some perspective on Bitcoin's $1 trillion market cap. The US has racked up roughly $3 trillion of debt between January 2021 and January 2022. That's $3 trillion in one year. This brings the US total debt to 30 trillion dollars 
one of the world's largest gold miners and producers, Barrick Gold Corp, has a market cap of around $43 billion. I cite Barrick because both the precious metal industry and Bitcoin involve mining. But instead of drills, trucks, elevators, and tons of specific machineries, computers are the capital required to increase Bitcoin's supply. Bitcoin is built on an algorithm that rewards Bitcoin miners. Bitcoin miners solve complicated cryptographical puzzles aimed to be solved by the entire world at around 10 minutes per block. That makes up the blockchain. Bitcoin mining has created some unique opportunities in parts of the world. Iceland, with its cold climate to keep hot servers cooled and offers actually quite abundant and cheap geothermal energy, has become a mecca for the 21st century digital miners. CoinMarketCap.com is one destination to stay up to date on the crypto market. This website is truly a cryptocurrency one-stop shop. It aggregates the market cap and volume of thousands of cryptocurrencies, displays Bitcoin's dominance of the industry, and shows the price of individual cryptocurrencies. CoinMarketCap also ranks the crypto market by volume traded and the cryptocurrency pairs traded. For example, Solana for Bitcoin or Ethereum for Tether, etc. Just like any standard or international fiat currency exchange, CoinMarketCap market cap is like going to Bloomberg to see data on trades between say US dollars and British pounds. A modifiable blockchain called Ethereum and its respective cryptocurrency Ether has excited a wide array of people in a number two spot on the cryptocurrency market cap ratings. Ether, the ticker being ETH, operates on the Ethereum blockchain. Because of Bitcoin's recent rally, it spurred a lot of traders to look for alternatives. And this has been to Ether's advantage. But it's not just Ether's status as an alternative cryptocurrency that has boosted the price. The Enterprise Ethereum Alliance was established to connect Fortune 500 companies with technology vendors to work on blockchain projects. The Alliance's vision, EEA, is to set the standard for blockchain solutions, making them open source and free to use. A couple of developments have come from this alliance. This second generation blockchain has learned from Bitcoin's first generational presence. Plus a large number of companies and technology experts on board have added significant publicity to Ethereum. One of the most important distinguishing features of Ethereum is that the first blockchain on the crypto scene that supports something called smart contracts. The Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, the EEA, defines smart contracts as, quote, applications that run exactly as programmed without any possibility of downtime, censorship, fraud, or third party interference. End quote. Imagine that you've got a great idea and want to raise capital through a Kickstarter program. With a smart contract built on Ethereum, it would hold the contributor's money until the campaign reaches either a specific date or a contribution threshold. Automatically. No clearinghouse or middleman are needed. No broker, no platform. Just the smart contract leaving you to focus on your ideas. And the contributors won't have to worry about counterparty risk. With a blockchain running the show, contributors' money will be returned on the agreed upon terms. There's no chance of some crook running away with the money. Let's say that your idea transforms into a legitimate business. Smart contracts on the blockchain are there to help again. The blockchain can collect proposals from shareholders and submit them through a transparent voting process. Smart contract advantages are many. A robot that only executes its program allows the global network to interface without third-party permission, with a record of excellent uptime. Combined with other fintech developments, smart contract blockchains help rapidly transform impactful ideas into businesses. Talk about exciting and empowering, especially for people in developing countries that don't have access to funding. With Ethereum or other smart contract cryptocurrencies, countless new products and services, businesses, and new ideas will come into existence that would have otherwise just remained in someone's head. Unique collaboration opportunities are already there on the Ethereum blockchain. For example, the website ethlance, that's E-T-H-L-A-N-C-E, connects freelancers with Ethereum-related work gigs. Unlike other freelance work jobs, ethlance spreads the website across the Ethereum network. The biggest differentiator is that ethlance doesn't take a cut of freelancers' earnings. Instead, each time a freelancer edits something on the ethlance database, they're assessed a nominal charge called a gas fee. Gas fees compensate the electricity cost of computers running the Ethereum blockchain. As Ethereum developers humbly admit, their blockchain technologies will be available for all things that have not been invented yet. Ambitious smart contract-based cryptocurrency projects may replace existing apps, from either like social networks to web tools like Google Docs, with ideally a decentralized version. No doubt that many would be delighted in Mark Zuckerberg's squirm when he cannot fully control the content from Facebook, oh sorry, Meta's mothership in Penlo Park, California. Now let's look at another cryptocurrency. Sixth by market cap to the behemoth Bitcoin and Ethereum is Ripple. After Bitcoin's meteoric rise, Ripple is about several tens of thousands cheaper than Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin, 
Ripple trades on crypto platforms under the symbol ticker XRP. But there are a couple of significant differences between Bitcoin and Ripple. Bitcoin operates on a decentralized ledger as an alternative to fiat currencies and traditional banking system. Ripple actively markets its blockchain for banks to improve their payment process. Think of Ripple as the ultimate banker's cryptocurrency. Ripple even has a seat on the United States Federal Reserve Faster Payment Task Force Steering Committee. Meaning, Ripple is primarily for banks' use, not for the people. Ripple's overwhelming amount of control by the banks mean that it's nearly as centralized as the dollar banknote. To me, that defeats the entire purpose of owning cryptocurrencies to start with. I earlier mentioned that Ethereum or other smart contract projects may form new social networks. Well, other blockchain technologies have already made this a reality. The blockchain and cryptocurrency basic attention token, ticker being BAT, runs the Brave browser, which is a search engine browser. Brave browser rewards people for viewing advertisements and people may reward content developers by tipping them if they so choose. There are so many benefits as well using the Brave browser. Do consider looking into it. Binance Coin, Solana, Terra, Cardano, and Avalanche are other notable cryptocurrencies by market cap. Together with stablecoins, stablecoins that are pegged to US dollar, this list rounds out the list of cryptocurrencies with a market cap of at least 20 billion as recording this insight. It would be disingenuous of me to skip straight to cryptocurrency opportunities and solutions without first addressing the risks. So here they are. First, cryptocurrencies face increasing resistance from feudalistic governments. Governments consider these developments a major threat to their status quo. They'd like to connect cryptocurrencies to nefarious activities such as money laundering, drug dealing, black markets, and terrorist activities. I'm, I'm sure this, some of this sounds familiar. And to make an example out of cryptocurrency, the United States handed out a life sentence without the possibility of parole, mind you, to Silk Road founder Ross Uberich. Silk Road is the darknet, deep web platform that has primarily transacted through cryptocurrencies. Moreover, some uninformed criminals would use ransomware attacks on a company and the government would use the opportunity to give Bitcoin proponents a smear because of some bad actors. Hackers essentially would take over the company's computer that held sensitive files like photos and emails for ransom. They demanded the payment in Bitcoin, possibly leading many to associate cryptocurrencies with such illicit activities. They would evidently get caught since Bitcoin isn't meant to be untraceable. Those that are criminals, the government enforcement agencies of the world would love for them to use Bitcoin so they may be easily traced and caught. If you're not a criminal, then the Bitcoin you have is your Bitcoin and you are free to execute your will and exercise your privacy without causing harm to others. Bitcoin is hope and love and freedom. A silver lining to government resistance is that cryptocurrency bans are difficult to enforce. That said, there are still other risks that definitely exist within cryptocurrency, just as there are with cash or funds held in a bank account. Here are some of the most common ways your cryptocurrency experience can definitely take a wrong turn. For example, 1. You lose your wallet private keys, credentials, or your password to access your funds. 2. You get hacked because you forgot to log out online or you haven't secured yourself properly and left things open. 3. Your anonymity was compromised because you volunteered who you were in connection with your address, your Bitcoin address or your cryptocurrency address. 4. Small market cap altcoins can be easily manipulated by large sums of money and you get rug pulled because you've invested into that project. 5. You get scammed by someone who has bad intentions by selling you a new cryptocurrency idea. First is losing your wallet private keys or getting hacked because your password isn't secure enough for your online presence. Darwinism hasn't yet eliminated the geniuses who use password for their password. Also, the same goes for nice security guys who employ the not-so-clever password, password1234. I'd guess that a decent number of people rotate several decent password combinations for maybe 50 or even 100 applications. And for those various applications, a forgotten username or password is usually just an email reset away. But there's a greater risk if you lose your cryptocurrency wallet credentials, also known as private keys. If you lose your private keys to access your crypto wallet, you've unofficially donated those funds to the market cap of those cryptocurrencies forever. You can remedy this risk with a password manager like 1Password or your favorite password manager. If you'll never forget the master password for these applications, that is. 
or you can memorize your cryptocurrency wallet private keys, which comes with its risks. Namely, a password that's simple enough to remember often means it's susceptible to hacking. If you're not taking crypto security seriously, it's like inviting that shady neighbor over to your house for dinner and then being surprised that your cash on the table has suddenly disappeared. The whole Mt. Gox fiasco many years ago is a prime example. Mt. Gox was sort of a exchange slash bank for cryptocurrencies. People essentially bought or sent their Bitcoin to Mt. Gox for safekeeping. And then one day, nearly $500 million was stolen from the company that went kaput. On a side note, Mt. Gox would have made no sense to me. There's no point of having a cryptocurrency and then handing it over to someone else and saying, hey, hold on to this for me. It's a classic case of the dangers of centralizing a decentralized currency. But Bitcoin stores like Mt. Gox are not the only institutions that feature a compromise. Exchanges and wallet providers compromise a cryptocurrency's anonymity. These sites typically require a comprehensive identity verification per Know Your Client or KYC rules. It's possible to gain the level of pseudo-anonymity that you desire. Use a different address for each transaction or hide your IP address using various technologies like a VPN, which is a virtual private network, or the Tor network. But Bitcoin speculators may not remain anonymous from governments forever. Revenue collection entities are and have been actively seeking those who have made a profit on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and did not report the gains to them if operated within the respective jurisdiction. For example, in 2017, the IRS used the John Doe summons to collect all the records from one of the cryptocurrency choke points, a trading website called Coinbase. This limited number of exchanges and wallets that compromise anonymity indicates another risk when it comes to cryptocurrencies, their market cap. And a tiny market cap when combined with thousands of cryptocurrencies can be an invitation for a pump and dump scheme, especially when Bitcoin price surges make headlines. If somebody wanted to torpedo a cryptocurrency, they'd run the currency up so people would feel like they're making a ton of money. And then they would pull the rug right from under them and watch the market collapse by 90% or in Squid Game's crypto case, 100% rug pulled. All these people who were buying would get burned and would swear to never buy crypto again. Confidence would be lost, which governments would absolutely welcome. Lastly, there's the possibility that you get scammed with an ICO, an initial coin offering. An ICO worked in 2017 and 2018, it was very popular, by selling digital tokens on the coin's platform or stashing it as an investment. Now, these ICOs were generally presented by companies that have not made much or any revenue for that matter, and they don't have anything that distinguishes them from bigger players. So this is not just a gamble, it's gambling squared. You're taking a risk on the company and the currency. It's not to say that every ICO is a scam either, but the risks can be very substantial, especially given that there are way too many people engaging in ICOs who either A, don't know what they're doing, or B, are preying on the ignorance of others. Of course, risks never stop a good bubble burst. In 2017, 18, most ICOs crashed, but they did raise billions of dollars. Over the past 10 years, central banks have flooded the world with more fiat currency than ever before, than the previous 5,000 years put together. Moreover, interest rates were pushed down to zero in some places even below zero in many countries. When fiat currencies are the only game in town, you play by the politician and banker's rules. If things go south, they create even more rules like capital controls. From Argentina to Venezuela, the world has seen how modern capital controls work in our modern times. And it ain't pretty at all. People would have to go to some shady places in Caracas to deal with black market money changers. Cryptocurrency eliminates all these issues. It doesn't matter if they ban cash or it doesn't matter if they freeze bank accounts. You'll still have Bitcoin and that's the one they don't control. So the opportunity and principal reason to own Bitcoin and well-researched cryptocurrencies are to become your own banker. Bitcoin ensures that nobody stands between you and your savings. Owning Bitcoin and non-centralized cryptocurrencies is a conscious decision to trade out of the centralized de facto fiat currency. Now you're at the controls. Your savings are right there on your phone or computer or hardware wallet. Decentralized crypto ledgers mean that no middleman will spy on you, freeze, or seize your bank account. No one will file a suspicious activity report when you transfer large sums of your Bitcoin. And you can conduct business with a currency that, unlike fiat currencies, doesn't rely on the government for its value. In short, Bitcoin transfers every bit of power to you. Bitcoin is often analogous to precious metals, decentralized assets which still exist outside of the banking system. But there's one key difference between cryptocurrencies and precious metals. We don't use gold and silver in daily transactions anymore. 
Precious metals are, instead, long-term stores of value. Gold and silver can weather financial storms, central bank monetary experiments, and even wars. Real money, precious metal coins, has been a store of value for thousands of years. In contrast, all fiat currencies are destined to reach their intrinsic value of zero. In the meantime, some fiat currencies are on the path to zero faster than others. A certain currency might be a better short-term store of value than a currency you currently own. But no fiat currency in the world provides a long-term store of value. If the Venezuelan Boulevard was a store of value, Caracas food vendors or, or toilet paper manufacturers, if they still existed, could still count boulevards. But they don't. They weigh them by the kilo. And you and your neighbors could still buy a burger for like 10 cents that they used to in the mid-20th century. Still, the rationale for owning Bitcoin is the same as owning precious metals. Again, it's a deliberate decision to exchange your fiat banknote currency for something else. And since you've traded out of your fiat banknote currency for cryptocurrency or precious metals, what sense does it make to trade back into a fiat banknote currency in the future? That's the wrong way to approach these concepts. And that's why discussing Bitcoin prices may be as useless as discussing the price of precious metals. But it seems that all cryptocurrency discussions begin and end with the price. So consequently, it puts people into making actually really bad financial mistakes. Incidentally, this is how many investors purchase stocks. Not when the price is low, but after a dramatic rise. As the prices rise, a former view that a stock is worthless may soon give way to hysteria. I've seen predictions that Bitcoin will reach 100,000 in a few months and a million by 2030. I have no idea how people come up with such price targets and timeframes. And setting aside the moonshot case, there are limited data to support the fact that they're even slightly under or overvalued now. Instead, many are engaging in blind speculation, but worse, speculation without any reference. Yes, you might miss out on some incredible speculative gains on your cryptocurrency, but the risks are also very palpable. I'm savvy enough to admit that I cannot predict cryptocurrency's future prices. Neither can anyone else. One could make the argument that there's still a lot of room to run, that Bitcoin and a few other cryptocurrencies are being recognized by nations and metropolis cities around the world. If this is true, Bitcoin can definitely go to 100,000 or beyond, but it could also drop to 25,000 or 17,000 because of some black swan event. It's best to abandon this whole infatuation with prices and view cryptocurrencies from an alternative perspective. But I am very optimistic about cryptocurrencies because the market and technology are constantly improving. With improved technology comes greater adoption. And with widespread adoption, wild swings should be a thing of the past, theoretically speaking. That's when the market will discover the true correct price for cryptocurrencies. Today, there are so many variables to contend with. Rising cryptocurrency prices for one are in large part tied to the international news and events. For example, when the Chinese government enacts new capital controls or some other draconian decree by some other nation, it generally moves the cryptocurrency price, but the capital controls restrictions won't actually limit you. Operating as your banker and holding decentralized cryptocurrencies certainly hedges against risks such as capital controls, especially when it comes to exercising your freedom, both in the future and now. Some may ask, Baz, how do you hold or store your cryptocurrency? Well, you gotta think of your cryptocurrency like other forms of money. You would not keep the entirety of your savings in your wallet and walk around downtown like that. You probably have some money in a bank, perhaps multiple banks. The same should go for your cryptocurrencies. Sure, so hold some of your cryptocurrencies on your mobile device like your crypto wallet for everyday transactions, just like you would with cash. But for most of your cryptocurrency savings, you should protect yourself from hackers and well, yourself. A lost or stolen phone with substantial cryptocurrency savings does not make for a good day, week, month, or year even. I recommend that you hold cryptocurrencies alongside other valuables with a reliable custodian. You at your home safe. This is called cold storage. A hardware wallet not connected to the internet. I use cold storage. I simply write down my wallet's code, a series of keywords, or a string of digits, and place it securely in my safe space and I'm the only one with access to it. This way, the bulk of my cryptocurrency holdings are not prone to any misfortune, and the convenience is still there. I can convert this series of keywords, my private keys, back into a digital hot wallet at any time. Hot being the opposite of cold, like cold storage being offline, hot wallets being online and connected to the internet, like an exchange or a phone app or a web browser application like MetaMask. And this is how you can be your own banker. You don't need to outsource the safekeeping of your crypto savings to anyone else. As for individual cryptocurrencies, I'd be very hesitant to chase down the latest fad currency. Doing so is highly speculative, and you may find yourself as a victim of a pump and dump scheme, even though some celebrities may endorse them for sponsorship reasons. 
and be wary if there's only a single company behind a cryptocurrency. This should raise a red flag around centralization and points of weaknesses. For new and upcoming crypto projects, look for those developed by groups or communities. You'll often find online forums where people are passionate about various technical components. In this new asset class, the safe route is to stick with proven winners, Bitcoin. Although there may be times where there will be losses in the market share, just remember, it is still the juggernaut and a great cryptocurrency to hold. Regardless of which cryptocurrency you research and choose, I cannot stress enough the security aspect. Think about your crypto holdings as you would your precious metals or investment art. You won't buy from a dodgy dealer and you're extremely careful about how you hold your investments. Crypto should be the same. To bring it all together, in the long battle between government centrally managed currencies versus decentralized cryptocurrencies, government fiats are going to lose as history shows due to unchecked currency debasement that they do. If you look at the fundamental paradigm of what Bitcoin is and what Bitcoin stands for, it makes so much sense. The fact that we have this central bank controlled system in the 21st century does not make any sense. However, many emerging cryptocurrencies are in this nascent stage where they'll be susceptible to risks, booms, and busts. And frankly, something that has a relatively small market capitalization can be very easily manipulated. But then again, despite these risks, it's incredibly exciting to have such developments that was once non-existent even just a decade ago. We've all seen how technology disrupts traditional strongholds. For example, taxi cabs don't like Uber. Hotels don't like Airbnb. Bookstores didn't like Amazon. Movie rental stores like Blockbuster didn't like Netflix. Banks don't like Bitcoin. Innovation isn't always liked right off the bat. It's not like the candle makers are the ones who invented the light bulb either. And the cryptocurrency developments that challenge our outdated financial institutions are the next step in this decentralized revolution. Cryptocurrencies are a reminder of what an incredible time it is to be alive. The next several years will undoubtedly bring a host of new crypto finance and blockchain developments that will empower entrepreneurs and investors alike. Finance as we know it today is likely to be unrecognizable within the next decade. I'm so enthusiastic about this march towards decentralization and it's going to be a beautiful future for all of us. If you enjoyed this insight, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new insight is shared. If you have any questions, feel free to reach me at Twitter, insights underscore savvy. If you haven't yet, I would immensely appreciate it if you took a moment to review and rate this podcast with either a four or five star review and share it with your friends if you so feel inclined. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some great insights that can help you in building yourself up to even greater heights. Until next time, carpe diem and stay savvy. Bye-bye.